Hello. Welcome. Thank you all for coming to my talk today, Implementing the Unimplementable, Bringing HLSL's Standard Library into Client. For those of you who don't know, my name is Chris. I'm a longtime contributor to LVM, and I work on the HLSL team at Microsoft. Today, I'm going to talk about the ongoing effort to bring HLSL support into Client, and specifically, the effort to bring the HLSL standard library implementation. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there with you all today. I tested positive for COVID the evening before my flight, so I'm staying here in Chicago and I'm presenting to you from my home. I will be available after the talk to answer questions remotely, assuming that technology doesn't fail us all. For those of you who aren't familiar with HLSL, HLSL is a programming language that was introduced with DirectX 9 for programming the then fairly new GPU rendering pipeline. It initially supported vertex and pixel shading, which were focused around the programmability for geometry and color pipelines. The language began its life as a C-like language, but it has evolved to include more and more C++ features, and so it's much more C++-like today. The language is largely source compatible with other common shader languages. So it isn't uncommon for game developers to implement some set of common functionality and use it in shaders for HLSL and other shading languages and to use the C preprocessor to handle the differences in the language where there are differences. HLSL is the first graphics focused programming language that's being implemented in Upstream Clang, and we're really excited about bringing graphics programmers into the Clang uh, user environment. HLSL is a language that isn't quite an overlap of C or C++. And so I like to think that it has enough C syntax to be familiar, but it has enough differences to be strange. And some of those differences are in places that you wouldn't expect. A lot of these differences stem from the fact that HLSL has an implicitly parallel programming model. And as a result, some C and C++ features, they just don't make sense in HLSL. The implicit parallelism is really important to HLSL though. GPU hardware isn't terribly consistent. You can kind of conceptually think of a GPU as a wide SIMD unit, but the widths of the SIMD units and the capabilities of the GPUs themselves vary pretty wildly from vendor to vendor. As a result, the implicit parallel programming model allows source programs written in HLSL to be portable to a variety of GPU architectures without engineers needing to rewrite the shaders for different GPUs. One of the side effects of this though is that when you see a vector in an HLSL source file, that is implicitly a vector of vectors. And so the amount of data that each little item uses is much larger than you might think initially at looking at the source. This means that some features of you know, traditional CPU code that you might take for granted, like being able to save and restore a register, it's much more expensive for HLSL because saving a single register isn't a single register, it's actually a vector of registers, probably 16 or 128, depending on your underlying architecture. HLSL has a huge ecosystem of tools. It can be used to target every major graphics API. It's used more or less everywhere that modern 3D games run. If you have a device that runs modern 3D games, someone has probably used HLSL to program that GPU. DXC, which is the current reference HLSL compiler is shipped with the DirectX and Vulkan SDKs. We also ship it on GitHub through our GitHub releases, and it is open source as a fork of Clang 3.7. HLSL has some pretty big missing features um, from C and C++, and this impacts how we implement our standard library. As the title of my talk suggests, the standard library actually isn't expressible in HLSL by itself. And so, the absence of, say, pointers and references, for example, is a really big challenge to work around. We also didn't have user-defined templates until 2021, but the standard library does use templates. We don't currently have any of the major C++11 features available, and the organic way that HLSL's language has grown has led to some pretty big gaps in the features. 
We're working to close those gaps, but it takes time. Oh, this is really awkward. Just give it a second. I swear it'll, it'll finish. Whew. Okay. So my bad jokes aside, um, shader compilers are super sensitive to performance and in part because shader compilers sometimes run at runtime. Um, and if you've ever played a game and you've sat there at a loading screen for a really long time and not understood why some of that might be our fault. Um, as a result, we're really, really conscious about performance from day one. Reparsing standard library headers can be really slow. Initializing or, or loading big chunks of ASTs can also be slow. And so lazy AST initialization is a really big win for HLSL. And I'll talk a bit more about how we use it. HLSL's library types are much like you'd expect for any C-based language. We have predefined type defs for commonly used data types like you might find in C stdint. We also have built-in vector and matrix types, and we have a large collection of built-in functions like you might find in math.h that include the math operations as well as operations that transmit data across the lanes of the SIMD unit or even across SIMD units. We also have these complex data types that we use for modeling data coming on and off the GPU. And those types are everything from textures to buffers to ray tracing paths through structures. And all of these things come together and we have a big standard library. And implementing that standard library requires that we balance some priorities for, for our implementation. And so we're balancing the desire to have a scalable and maintainable implementation of, of HLSL and Clang with the fact that we need a fast compiler and we wanna have really good tooling for our users because providing no tooling was not an option. So we started by adding an implicit HLSL.h. This is something new for HLSL and it works much like the OpenCL header does where any OpenCL file has an implicit include to OpenCL.h. Any HLSL file has an implicit include to HLSL.h. These header implementations are really easy and fast to write and test, which makes it really great for us for, from a maintainability and scalability perspective. There are some downsides. Reparsing it over and over again for every shader invocation can be really slow. Also, we're limited in what language features we can use in the header because we want this header to work on all of the language versions of HLSL. And so we've really restricted ourselves to just having type defs and mapping functions to built-ins in these headers. It still makes them useful, but it does have some constraints. When we look at some of the more complex data types, our problems become pretty apparent. So this pseudo C++ code shows how the HLSL vector type would be implemented in C++. There's a few things that should jump out right away. One is that it actually is pretty simple. It can just be a type alias of the Clang EXT vector because HLSL's vector behaves more or less just like Clang's vector extension. The problem is it's a template and templates aren't supported in HLSL until the HLSL 2021 language version. So we need a way to implement this for older versions of HLSL as well. Our solution is to define this on the AST directly during AST initialization. We really only do this for trivial types and that's mostly types that have no methods and are frequently used. The idea here being most significant HLSL shaders are going to have at least one vector. So having a vector type that's always initialized is probably worth it. Initializing during AST initialization makes the type available immediately before we parse the first line of code. It also allows us to bypass the parsing of the unsupported language features like the HLSL uh, templates that weren't supported in HLSL 2018. As we look at some of our more complex data types, we need to have a solution for lazily populating the ASTs. What we really want is to be able to forward declare the types during initialization and then populate the definitions on use. The Clang external AST source solves exactly this problem for us. And so it's great that we didn't have to invent it ourselves. 
If you're not familiar with the external AST source, it's the basis for pre-compiled headers and modules. It's designed to enable lazy deserialization of bitcode ASTs. It's also used by LLDB and some of the tooling APIs to be able to insert additions into the ASTs as the compiler needs them. The most important API for us in this is the external AST source complete type interface. This interface is where we build all of our ASTs for our complex types off of. The way that we do this is we have a built-in type builder pattern that we've implemented in our external AST source. During initialization of the external AST source, we forward declare the data type in a way that it is marked as incomplete and external. This allows us so that when the data type needs to be completed by the rules of the language, the external semi-source will get a call to complete the data type. We have a callback that's registered inside of our external AST source that then calls the function to initialize the data type the rest of the way. This works really well for us and it's a really great way to lazily initialize the AST. As we're working down this path, we're also trying to capture as much information as we can in, in the AST. We're extending HLSL with a variety of internal attributes to carry additional information. This allows us to have complete ASTs for all of our data types, including their method bodies. And it lets us minimize our code gen changes that we need later in the compiler. Because of this, we're basically using most of the C++ code gen path without any modifications. This also gives us a really great tooling experience because our ASTs are complete and so Clang D knows where everything is and what everything is and can give autocomplete and hover and all of the other things that you expect. When we look a little more closely at our internal attributes, these are attributes that have no spelling, so they can't be written in user code, but it allows us to never string match or pointer match on record data types to ensure that the type is one of the built-in types. We use these attributes to model the special behaviors of the built-in types, like our special code generation requirements and our initialization behaviors. This is really important for HLSL because as a GPU programming language, some of our built-in types, like our buffers and texture types, they need to be initialized by the GPU driver. So we need to have extra metadata in the code generation path to tell the GPU driver at runtime how to initialize those buffers. In the future, we plan to extend HLSL with more of these internal attributes. Today, we have a whole bunch of IR-based analysis that we want to move into the AST and Clang CFG. We'll be able to do this by augmenting our ASTs with even more internal attributes to capture more of the semantics of the language. We also can use this to generate higher quality diagnostics earlier and more consistently in our compiler, which we think will be a great improvement for our users. As we've been working on all of these things, one of the questions we keep asking ourselves is, are any of these HLSL features valuable to C++? And this led to an RFC I posted earlier this year called YOLO, Woot, and Kaboom. The idea here being, can we take the attributes that we need in HLSL in order to model the complex initialization requirements of data types and apply that to C++ in user code so that a user can define the contracts of how their data type should be used in their source. It's kind of an interesting experiment. Um, this code sample is a little too much to read on the screen, I'm sure, but the gist of it is if you can model a state machine in the Clang CFG, we can actually provide these diagnostics. Now, I don't know if this is a change that's actually worth bringing in as a Clang extension to C++, but it was a very interesting thought experiment. And we're gonna continue this thought experiment for other HLSL features. Another one that might be interesting for C++ is HLSL's matrix element access syntax. Um, much like the uh, Clang EXT vector, HLSL's matrix supports swizzling and, and element access in ways that might be really useful in C++ code as well. Checking back in on our balanced priorities, 
Our goal here is really to do as much as we can in HLSL and, and leverage the HLSL language to implement as much of the library as we can. We balance that with having lazy AST population for the complex data types that we can't model in the HLSL and ensuring that that lazy AST initialization works with pre-compiled headers and modules. That allows us to get kind of the best of both worlds where we can get good performance and the scalability and maintainability of being able to write in HLSL. All of this also gives us complete ASTs and we have source available where it, we can which gives us great tooling and a wonderful tooling experience built off of Clang D. In the future, we're going to keep working on expanding HLSL support in Clang. Our goal is to have some amount of support available for Clang D and Clang 16 so that we can start getting experimental support into our users' hands early. We also have recently come out with a public language design process that's modeled after the Rust RFC and Swift evolution process. And it allows us to try and gather feedback from our users about which direction they want us to take HLSL in. We're actively working to make HLSL more like C++, but having user feedback and having the ability to get public feedback is going to give us a way to narrow our focus and get the important things in first. If you're interested in learning more about HLSL or the ongoing work we're doing, we do have a monthly HLSL working group meeting that is on the LVM community calendar. The meeting brings people from the LVM community and from Microsoft and our collaborators, but also brings in game developers and users as well. And so it's a really great uh, environment to get great information and feedback. We also track all of the issues that we're working on actively under uh, a HLSL support project on the GitHub LVM organization. So you can see what we're doing in real time. And we've been keeping the Clang docs for HLSL up to date, and, and we're trying to make those a really great source for documentation. You can also find me and many of my team members on Discord and Discourse, and I'm always lurking on IRC, so you can hit me there too. Since you've all made it to the end of my presentation, and thank you for being patient with me here, um, as a consolation prize for me not being there in person, this is my puppy, Yuki. Um, she is the unofficial mascot of HLSL, and she has a loose tooth that she's just trying to get out, and she keeps punching herself in the face. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a great dev meeting. <laughs>